U.S. Navy history arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and I am joined by my XO, Steven. Hey there, everyone. So, this week, we will continue with more battles from the Atlantic of the War of 1812. Let's get underway. All right, let's go. So, this week, we're going to start with the Battle of Rappahannock River. This was fought in 1813. It was between a British force blockading the Rappahannock River in Virginia, who sent several hundred men in boats to attack four American privateers. I'm sure you already can tell what's going to, who's going to come out on top here. Yeah, but let's find out anyways, for those who don't. So on April 1st, a British squadron, which had the ships San Domingo and Marlboro, wow, they named cigarettes after a British boat. <laughs> Four frigates, Acosta, Narcissus, Maidstone, and Startia. They also had two brigs, Mohawk and Fatomine, and a schooner, the High Flyer. These guys were all blockading the Rappahannock from Lyhaven Bay. They already had several American prizes and were set to capture a lot more. So the British commanders, they decided to prepare a cutting out expedition where small boats would attempt to capture larger boats that were anchored. Pretty much catch them with their pants down. Or attempt to. Okay. You know, the poop deck, they were, <laughs> that's where your pants are down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next day, the British, they dispatched 17 pinnacles and barges, launches, and other boats with a few carronades to go around the bay. Each of these boats carried up to 50 marines and sailors, but mainly armed with steel. How, when you say steel, you mean cutlasses and bayonets and daggers? Anything sharp. Okay. Lieutenant James Polkinghorn was in command of this expedition. And when they were abreast of Windmill Point at about 1600, they sighted five American vessels and gave chase all through the night until they lost sight of them when they came to a turn in the river. Now, the British, they had difficulty rowing up the river. So during the descent, 12 of the boats fell very far behind, leaving only five of them. So they had about one 12 pound gun and 105 officers and men to attack these boats. I don't like those odds. <laughs> Four of the pursued ships were armed schooners under Captain William F. Stafford in the 12-gun Dolphin. The others were the Lynx of six guns, the Racer also of six guns, and the Arab of seven guns. In all, the American schooners mounted around 30 guns with 160 men. Much better rods. Fun little note. All these vessels were made in Baltimore. So Captain Stafford had little choice but to scuttle the schooners or to fight. So he decided to fight and anchored his ships in a battle line with the port side guns facing the mouth of the river where the British would come into view. Now the Arab, which was the biggest of the ships, she had a crew of 45 men, and she weighed about 380 tons. She was positioned sternmost in the line because she was considered to be the most warlike of the four. The Dolphin was about 300 tons, and she was the headmost as she was the flagship of Captain Stafford's. She carried around 98 men. Now, when the British came within sight of the American line, they stopped. They wanted to wait for the wind and the remaining 12 boats that they 
got separated from. So after a few more minutes, the wind was still calm. So the lieutenant ordered an attack in order to deny the Americans time to prepare defenses or to escape. Polkinghorne sent a boat with the 12 pound cannon forward to start an artillery duel with the intention of delaying the Americans. But of course this failed when Stafford ships all opened fire with a combined broadside. <laughs> uh. <laughs> the Americans didn't have many guns, but that was still more guns than one. Uh, you gotta love Leroy Jenkins moments. Yeah. So at this point, Lieutenant Polkinghorn, he decided to stop waiting and led his boats directly for the center of the two American ships, which were the Racer and the Lennox. Both of them were about 280 tons with crews of 76 men each. So as the British closed, the Americans fired more broadsides. So Polkinghorn and his men decided to alter course and head straight for the Arab. When the British drew near, there were only three boats left, two having been hit and sunk by the American shots. So the Arab tacked to try to bring her starboard guns into, into the battle, but she was boarded before achieving this maneuver. So her captain decided to run her aground. After that, Racer and Lennox were taken quickly. Their crew surrendered as the British climbed onto their decks and a number of other sailors decided to jump over the side to escape being captured. Now, when the British went for the Dolphin, Captain Stafford himself put up a very stubborn fight, and it took about 15 minutes for the British to secure the vessel. So five Americans were wounded before Dolphin struck her colors, which ended the battle. But casualties from the other privateers totaled to six killed and five wounded. By the time the fight was over, the other British boats arrived and assisted in taking about 100 prisoners. Way to be late to the party. So Polkinghorne reported that only two of his men were killed and 11 wounded, which included himself, actually. American newspapers, however, reported that at first that 50 Britons had been killed. Then they reduced their claim later to 19. So very contradictory numbers. So historians, British and Americans, later put the British losses at two dead and 11 wounded, and American losses at 16 dead and wounded. And the battle lasted about 15 minutes. And I guess this just shows the value of having uh, experienced Marines among your crew. Because, you know, you tell me you have effectively five large rowboats with one cannon between all of them, and even though these are lightly armed schooners, I was thinking, oh, well, they're, they're just going to get blown out of the water, these five rowboats. And some did. But... Three of them. Yeah, yeah. But two in their complement made it and, and just worked their way down the line. So Captain Stafford later returned to Baltimore. He was treated well while he was in captivity, partly due to his treatment of British prisoners from the prizes that he captured. The Lennox was taken into British service as Mosquito Bit and was sold to private companies in 1820. Fun fact, a replica of the Lynx is in California. Huh. Racer became Shellborn and the Dolphin retained her name. It was difficult for the British to free the Arab, but they eventually succeeded. Apparently, she was very badly damaged and was not commissioned to serve in the British Navy. Well, electing to uh, intentionally beat yourself, and I'm assuming going as fast as he could manage in those conditions, probably doesn't lend itself to keeping your ship in good shape, which was the intention. Well, whenever you run a ship aground, you're going to do massive damage to the hull, especially to a wooden ship. <laughs> but, I mean, they're made of wood, which is made of tree which comes from the ground. It should be right at Elm on land. Do you think maybe they were trying to plant the ship to grow more ships? <laughs> well, no, that's just silly talk. 
Ships don't grow from trees. Well, fine then. How about we just talk about the capture of the USS Chesapeake then? Okay, that, that sounds fair. Okay. So this battle was fought on June 1st in 1813 between the frigates HMS Shannon and the USS Chesapeake. So Captain Philip Broke was in command of the Shannon for a very long time. He introduced practical refinements to his guns, which were actually unheard of in naval gunnery. He had dispart sights fitted to his 18-pound long guns, which improved aiming as they compensated for the narrowing of the barrels from the breech to the muzzle. He had the elevating quions, which were wedge-shaped pieces of wood placed under the breech, of his long guns grooved to mark various degrees of elevation so that his guns could be reliably leveled to fire horizontally in any state of healing of the ship under a press of sail. The cannonades were also similarly treated, but the elevating screws on the cannons were marked in paint. He also introduced a system where bearings were incised into the deck next to each gun, which means that fire could be then be directed to any bearing independent of the ability of any particular gun crew to see the target. So fire from the whole battery of the ship could be focused on any part of an enemy ship. Why wasn't this a common practice? Because it hadn't been invented yet. Okay, well, g give this guy a raise. Make him, like, put him in a position where he can actually make this widely implemented. Th these are good ideas. So Broke drilled his crew to an extremely high standard of naval gunnery. He had them fire on targets regularly, like floating barrels. Mm-hmm. And often he would make these drills into competitions between the gun crews to see how fast and how accurately they could hit a target. He actually even had his gun crews fire at targets blindfolded to good effect. They were only given the bearing to aim their gun without being allowed to sight the gun on the target themselves. This constituted a very early example of director firing, which is what a lot of our vessels used during World War II. Wow. So, in addition to these gunnery drills, Broke was fond of preparing hypothetical scenarios to test his crew. For example, after all hands had been drummed to quarters, he would inform them of a theoretical attack and see how they would defend the ship. Although the use of cutlasses in training was avoided. So not only was he pioneering, you know, gun crew direction, making refits to his cannons to improve accuracy. He was pioneering naval war games. Not naval war games. He was pioneering drills. Okay. Keeping your crew in readiness. What we do nowadays when on a six month deployment, we would have drills just about every day, whether they be uh, general quarters where they would put a huge amount of hypothetical scenarios together and we would train on fighting the ship and defending the ship. There would be also man overboard drills. There would be mass casualty drills. There would be fire drills. There would be flooding drills. Anything and everything that we could encounter, whether it be responding to an accident, responding to action from an enemy, we were highly trained in it and we practiced it over and over and over again. This is what this, this is what this guy was doing. And he was the first one to do this. I mean, it's definitely a good idea. Even if you aren't in a state of war, you should always be prepared for it. Yeah. So at this point, he is now eager to engage and defeat one of the American frigates who had already scored a number of victories over the Royal Navy in single ship confrontations. So Broke prepared a challenge. Now the USS president had already slipped out of the harbor under the cover of fog and evaded the British. The constitution was undergoing extensive repairs 
and alterations and would not be ready to get underway for a very long time. Now the Chesapeake, well, she appeared to be ready to get underway. So Broke decided to challenge the Chesapeake, which had been refitting in Boston. And she was under the command of Captain James Lawrence. So while patrolling off shore, the Shannon intended to intercept and capture a number of American ships attempting to reach the harbor. Now, he sent two of them off to Halifax. He found that his crew had been dangerously reduced. So he decided to resort to burning the rest of the prizes because he wanted to conserve his highly trained crew in anticipation of a battle with the Chesapeake. Boats from these burned prizes were sent into Boston carrying Broke's oral invitation to Lawrence to come out and fight him. So, this is the naval equivalent of, Oh, Lawrence, come out to play, yay! Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Look what I keep doing, come out and stop me. <laughs> so he had sent some of his fleet away, hoping that more favorable odds would entice the Americans out. But he started to think that the Chesapeake would never come out of the harbor. So he decided to send a written challenge. He was actually copying his advisory. Lawrence had earlier in the war, when captain, when he was captain of the sloop of war, Hornet, sent a written invitation to the captain of the British sloop, Bonnie Sidion, to challenging him to a single ship contest. And Lawrence's offer had been declined. Would you like to hear what the note said? I would love to hear what this note said. As the Chesapeake appears, now ready for sea, I request you will do me the favor to meet the Shannon with her, ship to ship, to try the fortune of our respective flags. The Shannon mounts 24 guns upon her broadside and one light boat gun, 18 pounders upon her main deck and 32 pounder carronades upon her quarter deck and forecastle. It is manned with a complement of 300 men and boys, besides 30 seamen, boys and passengers who were taken out of recaptured vessels lately. I entreat you, sir, not to imagine that I am urged by more personal vanity to the wish of meeting the Chesapeake, or that I depend only upon your personal ambition for your acceding to this invitation. We have both noble motives. You will feel it a compliment if I say that the result of our meeting may be the most grateful service I can render to my country, and I doubt not to you equally confident of success. We'll feel convinced that it is only by repeated triumphs and even combats that your little navy now hope to console your country for the loss of that trade it can no longer protect. Favor me with a speedy reply. We are short of provisions and water and cannot stay long here. Philip broke. <laughs> that is the most polite and yet backhanded compliment at the same time. And, hey, bro, 1v1 me. Private server, come on. Oh, yeah, he totally nagged him. I... <laughs> did, did he take it? What was the reply? So, Captain Lawrence, he actually didn't receive the letter. And according to the author Ian W. Toll, it would have not made a difference. Because Lawrence intended to sail the Chesapeake, at the first day of favorable weather. So he never got the letter, but he unintentionally took the invitation. Yeah. Well, okay, Rook got what he wanted. So, when the USS President had slipped out of the harbor, it was to go on a commerce raiding mission, which was deemed in the U.S. national interest. Half of the officers and up to a quarter of the crew were new to the ship. Oh, that's not good. So in the short time he was in command of the Chesapeake, Lawrence had twice exercised his crew at the guns, walking his decks, personally supervising the drills. He also instigated a signal 
a bugle call to call on his crew to board an enemy vessel. Unfortunately, the only crew member able to produce a note on the bugle was a, quote, dull-witted, lobely boy called William Brown. He was a surgeon's assistant. That, that's not a position you assign to someone who's dim-witted. But he didn't say dim, he said dull. I don't know if that makes a difference, I, but we will <laughs> say that in this case. <laughs> uh, okay, if his job as surgeon's assistant was essentially to, now, hold him down and make sure he doesn't move, then yes, good surgeon's assistant probably, but... I'm pretty sure that's all a surgeon's assistant would have to do. Back then? Remember, no painkillers. <laughs> oh, sure there is. Whiskey. Rum. Blunt force trauma to the head. Whiskey and rum. That's why so many of these guys bled out. <laughs> so, Lawrence, he believed that he would win the battle and wrote two quick notes. One to the Secretary of the Navy pronouncing his intentions and another to his brother-in-law asking him to look after his wife and children in the event of his death. So at this time, the Shannon had been off Boston for 56 days and was running short of provisions. And while the extended period at sea was wearing the ship down, period. So this means that she would be at a disadvantage when facing the Chesapeake, who was fresh from harbor and just had a refit. So obviously wooden ships require a lot of maintenance. But, you know, being at sea for, let's say, three months, nice round number. If she's been waiting for 56 days for uh, the American captain, what sort of uh, disadvantages would this be providing? Just the wood beginning to rot and needing to be resealed or? Well, less rot and more. There'd be more water in the hull. I mean, wind does damage. Boys being boys does damage, <laughs> boredom. There, there's all sorts of things that will damage a ship. Oh, oh, so it'd be no different than, you know, driving your car for 10,000 miles without doing an oil change or, you know, realigning your wheels, rotating your tires. Yeah, it's just normal wear and tear. Okay, it'll still work for its intended purpose, but it won't be running optimally. Exactly. Okay. So, a boat was dispatched from the Shannon with that letter. It was being held by a Mr. Sklom, who was a American prisoner. And he had not reached the shore when the Chesapeake got underway. She was flying three American flags and a large white flag at the foremast, which had inscribed on it, Free Trade and Sailors' Rights. <laughs> Nice. I, I was wondering why a white flag, but I, I guess all the better to make the nice, big, bold, black text pop. Mm-hmm. So the Shannon, she carried 276 officers, seamen, and marines. Eight recaptured seamen, 22 Irish laborers, which only four of them could speak English, 24 boys, 13 of these guys under 12 years old. That answers the question I was about to ask, because I know the Royal Navy made a habit of, you know, taking either well-connected or uh, talented boys as junior officers and then, you know, raising them through puberty in the Navy so that by the time that they're adults, they are already officers and capable. So Americans did the same thing. The boys would be mainly used as message runners. Hmm, okay. And I've heard other things that they were used as, which we will not get into on this podcast. Yeah. And this is the Shannon we're talking about, so this is the Brits. So, Broke had trained his gun crews to fire accurate broadsides into the hulls of enemy vessels instead of the rigging, with the goal of killing their gun crews. So Lawrence was confident in his ship, especially since she had a larger crew. And of course, the previous American victories gave him a, he expected success because of these. So just before the battle started, the Americans gave three cheers. Talk about going in there with a overinflated eagle. 
Well, it, it's good to have confidence before going into something like that. If you go in with a defeatist mindset, you're already, you know, going in with one foot in the grave. So, as the American ship approached, Broke spoke to his crew. He ended with a description of his philosophy of gunnery. Quote, Throw no shot away. Aim every one. Keep cool. Work steadily. Fire into her quarters, main deck to main deck, quarter deck to quarter deck. Don't try to demast her. Kill the men, and the ship is yours. So, he wasn't so much about trying to disable and take it as prize. He was, if they don't have a crew, they can't resist, and we can always repair it. Exactly. I mean, ruthless but effective? It's definitely a different way of thinking about naval engagements during this time. So at about 1730, the two ships meet around 20 nautical miles east of the Boston Light, which is between Cape Ann and Cape Cod. Shannon was flying a weather-worn blue ensign. And she actually looked pretty rough because of how long she had been at sea, which gave the captain of the American ship the impression that she would be an easy opponent. So the HMS Shannon refused to fire upon the USS Chesapeake as she bore down on her. And the USS Chesapeake would not rake HMS Shannon, despite her having the weather gauge. Why? Because they were both trying to be gallant. I, guys, I get it. You want to be, you know, gentlemanly officers having a personal rivalry in the name of king and country and president and nation, respectively. You're at war. Just do the thing. <laughs> so both of the ships opened fire just before 1800 at a range of about 35 meters. So the Shannon scored the first hit, striking the Chesapeake on her forward gun ports with two round shot and a bag of musket balls. When you say a bag of musket balls, like someone just loaded a bag of musket balls into a cannon? Yep, anti-personnel. Oh, okay. Now the Chesapeake was moving faster than the Shannon. And then she ranged down the side of the British ship. The destruction that was inflicted by the precise gunnery of the British crew moved aft with the American forward gun crews suffering the heaviest losses. Now, the crew of the American vessel were well-drilled, and despite the losses inflicted on them from the Shannon's gunnery crews, returned fire quickly as the Chesapeake was healing, which caused many of their hits to strike the water or waterline of the Shannon, causing very little damage. But the American carronade fire caused a lot of serious damage to the Shannon's rigging. For example, a 32-pound carronade ball struck the piled shot for the Shannon's 12-pound gun that was stowed in the main chains, and the shot was propelled through the timbers to scatter like hail across the gun deck. That seems like a really, really poor place to uh, keep your shot. Or a really, really lucky hit by the other guys. Or that. So Captain Lawrence realized that his ship's speed would take it past the Shannon, and ordered a pilot's luff. This was a small and brief turn to windward, which would make the sails shiver and reduce the ship's speed. So, just after the Chesapeake began turning this limited turn away from the Shannon, she had her means of maneuvering entirely disabled, as a second round of accurate British fire caused more losses. Most critically, on the men and officers manning the Chesapeake's quarterdeck, where the helmsman was killed by a nine-pound gun that broke, had ordered installed on 
his quarter deck for that very purpose. I mean, having a cannon dedicated to aiming for the opposing helmsman, again, ruthless but effective. And then he used that gun again to shoot away the helm completely. So the surviving American gun crews, they did land hits on the Shannon in their second broadside. The American carronade fire swept Shannon's forecastle, killing three and wounding a number of others, which disabled the Shannon's nine pound bow gun. And one round demolished the ship's bell. So at just about the same time when, you know, her helm was destroyed, her four topsail hell yard was shot away. Her four topsail yard then dropped and she luffed up, which means she lost her forward momentum. So while the conditions aren't becalmed, she was effectively under becalmed conditions. Well, she ended up yawing further into the wind until she was quote, in irons, which means that her sails were pressed back against her masts. So she was now going in reverse. Yeah, that, that's not what a sailing ship is supposed to do. So now that she's going sternward or reverse, her port stern quarter made contact with the Shannon starboard side, level with the fifth gun port on the bow. And then the Chesapeake was caught by the projecting fluke of one of Shannon's anchors because they had stowed it on the gangway. And now the ships are locked together and this is where the Marines come in, I assume? Actually, the Chesapeake spanker boom was swung over the deck of the British ship. And Mr. Stevens, who was Broke's boatswain, lashed the boom inboard to keep the two ships together, losing an arm as he did this. So now that they were trapped against the Shannon at an angle in which not very many of her guns could fire on the British and she can't get away, the Chesapeake stern was now exposed and was swept by raking fire. So now the destruction that her forward gun crews experienced with the first broadside was inflicted on the crews on the aft part of the ship. The situation got worse when a small open cask of musket cartridges, which were adrift in the mizzen mast, blew up. Now, the smoke cleared and Broke was able to get a good view. He decided that the time was right to board. Captain Lawrence also gave the order to board. I mean, what else is he going to be able to do? Uh, yeah, no, your options are a bit exhausted at this point. But uh, William Brown, he was the bugler aboard the Chesapeake. He was scared as all get out. His pants were probably brown. So he failed to sound the boarding call. So th the only guys to board were the ones, or the only ones to hear the order were the guys right near Lawrence. And then very shortly after issuing the order to board... Lawrence was mortally wounded by small arms fire. Now, the few guys that did hear his order to board did fall back from their cannon and arm themselves for hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the British took this as a disorderly retreat. And that actually bolstered their morale. So at this time, a party of men with small arms rushed aboard the Chesapeake. And Broke actually led this party. I'm guessing that wasn't common for the captains to lead the boarding party. Uh, it depends on the captain, I guess. So, a couple of them were killed immediately. But Captain Broke, he was at the head of about 20 men. He stepped from the rail of the waist hammock netting and onto the muzzle of the after carronade of the Chesapeake. And from there, he jumped down to her quarterdeck. The main deck of the Chesapeake was just about deserted because they had just been swept by Shannon's gunfire. Right. So the surviving gun crews had either responded to the call for boarders or had hidden below. So two American officers, Lieutenant Cox 
and Midshipman Russell actually saw that the aftmost 18 pound guns on the port side still was able to be aimed at the Shannon. And they worked together to fire both of them. Nice. Uh, a Lieutenant Ludlow had been slightly wounded and had gone down to the Chesapeake's cockpit for treatment. And on his return to the upper decks, he rallied some of the American crew as he, as he went. He led them in a counterattack and pushed the British back as far as the binnacle. But a wave of British reinforcements arrived at this time, and Ludlow received a mortal wound from a cutlass. And, of course, the Americans were again thrown back. So now the Americans had no officers to lead them and no support from below, which caused them to be driven back by the British borders. And then the resistance fell apart, with the exception of the men on the forecastle and those in the tops, top masts. Right, right. Speaking of the top masts, uh, sharpshooters on both sides had started shooting at each other. <laughs> and, of course, those below on the deck that were exposed. So a British marksman had command of the four top. He stormed the Chesapeake's foretop over the yardarm and killed all the Americans there. At this point, the wind actually tore the two ships apart, and Chesapeake was blown around the bows of the Shannon. This left about 50 British boarders stranded. Luckily for them, organized resistance had pretty much stopped at this time. Broke he led another charge, this time against a number of Americans who managed to rally themselves on the forecastle, and three American sailors from the rigging descended to attack them. These guys took him by surprise. He killed one of them, but a second one actually shot him with a musket and stunned him. And then the third sliced open his skull with a saber. Oof. Which... Of course, knocked him to the deck. Yeah. But before that sailor could finish him off, he was bayoneted by a British Marine. The Shannon's crew rallied to the defense of their captain and carried him to the forecastle, killing the rest of the Americans. So wait, was the Chesapeake crew wiped out to a man then? No. But if you continue to fight, you continue to die. Right, right. So... So while the captain was getting his some medical treatment, the Shannon's first lieutenant, Mr. George T.L. Watt, tried to hoist the British colors over the Chesapeake. But this was interpreted incorrectly by those aboard the Shannon. And he got hit in the forehead by grape shot before he was able to do this. That's a wee bit of miscommunication. Just a little bit. So the British, at this point, had cleared the upper decks of the American resistance, and most of the Chesapeake's crew had taken refuge on the berth deck. A musket or pistol shot from the berth deck killed a British Marine who was guarding this hatchway. So the furious British crewmen then began firing through this hatchway at the Americans who were crowded below. Lieutenant Charles Leslie Faulkner, who had commanded the boarders that rushed the main deck, restored order by threatening to blow out the brains of the next person to fire. Then he demanded that the Americans send up the man who had killed the British Marine, a guy named William Young, adding that the Chesapeake was captured and, quote, we have 300 men aboard. If there is another act of hostility, you will be called up on deck one by one and shot. And Faulkner was given command of the Chesapeake as a British prize vessel after this. So this battle had lasted only 10 minutes, according to the Shannon's log, or 11 minutes by Lieutenant Wallace's watch. So 11, 10, 11 minutes. It's still incredibly fast and incredibly decisive. Now, Broke, he actually claimed modestly 15 minutes. In his official dispatches. Still fast. 
So Shannon had lost 23 men killed and 56 wounded. Chesapeake, 48 dead, which included four lieutenants, the master, and many of her other officers, and 99 wounded. Shannon had been hit by a total of 158 projectiles. Chesapeake by 362. So you can see how training and these new gunnery inventions change naval warfare. Yeah, that was, like I said, incredibly decisive. I think that's the fastest one we've had yet. Yeah. So uh, did Broke end up recovering from his wounds? Because a cutlass to the skull, actually splitting it open, does not sound like something one quickly or easily recovers from, let alone at sea. Um, he actually did. He never commanded a ship again because the head wound from the cutlass exposed his brain. And it had been so severe that initially he was, it was pronounced fatal by the ship's surgeon. But he did survive the wound into old age of about 64. Well, nice. Although, you know, he was debilitated. Right. He suffered from headaches and other neurological problems for the rest of his life. So in the time that both of the batteries of the ships were firing, the Americans had been exposed to 44 round shot, while the British had received 10 or 11. So even before being boarded, the Chesapeake had lost the gunnery duel by a huge margin, obviously. Captain Lawrence had been mortally wounded by fire from the Shannon's foretop and was carried below before the Chesapeake was boarded as we, that was his last order was to board the Shannon before he got hit himself. Right. And that order wasn't really received by any of the crew aside from the small handful that were nearby. Right. He did issue one more order before dying and which was to quote, don't give up the ship. So at least he, I get, at least he didn't see that, I guess. So a large cask of unslacked lime was found open on the Chesapeake's forecastle, and another bag of lime was discovered in the foretop. Now, the sailors on the British side alleged the intention of this was to throw handfuls of lime powder into the eyes of the Shannon's men in an unfair and dishonorable manner as they attempted to board, though this was actually never done. Historians have called this allegation absurd because lime is always carried in ship stores as a disinfectant. And the fact that it was left on the deck after the ship was cleared for battle was probably due to the neglect of a junior or petty officer. I, I was going to say, lime is something that anybody would want to have on their ship back then. I mean, it, it was effectively soap. Yeah. So, a... Prize crew was put aboard the Chesapeake. The commander of the prize, as we said before, was Lieutenant Faulkner. He, you know, he had a good deal of trouble from the Americans, who, of course, outnumbered him and his men. So he had some of the leaders of the unrest transferred to the Shannon in leg irons that had been shipped aboard the Chesapeake to deal with the expected British prisoners. The rest of the crew were rendered docile by a carpenter who cut scuttles in the main deck. And then two 18-pound cannons loaded with grape shot were pointed at them. Yeah, 18-pound uh, shotguns have a tendency to quell unrest. Yeah. So the Shannon, which is now being commanded by Provo Wallace, since her captain is hurt, escorted the Chesapeake into Halifax, getting there on June 6th. When both of these frigates came into the harbor, the naval ships that were already there manned their yards and bands played, played music and each ship Shannon passed greeted her with cheers. The 320 Americans who survived the battle were imprisoned on Meville Island in 1813 and their ship 
were taken into British service and renamed the HMS Chesapeake. So they kept the name. <laughs> and she was used to ferry prisoners from Mevel to England's Dartmoor prison. Now, a number of their officers were paroled to Halifax, but then a number of them began a riot when a band performed a patriotic song about the Chesapeake's defeat, which made the parole restrictions tightened. Yeah, that, that's just kind of rubbing salt in the wound. You, you won. You don't need to rub it in their face. Now, this was actually the first major victory in naval war, in the naval war for the British. The capture, of course, raised the morale of the Royal Navy. So, the Shan... So, blah. So the Shannon departed for England on October 4th with Broke. And they arrived in Portsmouth on November 2nd. So after this battle, Lieutenant Wallace and Faulkner were promoted to the rank of commander. And Broke was made a baronet in September. The Court of Common Council of London awarded him the freedom of the city and a sword worth 100 guineas. He also received a plate worth 750 pounds and a cup worth 100 guineas. For getting your head sliced open, here's a plate and a cup. <laughs> I'm sure it had more sentimental value than what I just said, but it still feels off. Well, and don't forget the sword. Here, take this. It should help someone from uh, taking another sword to your skull. I don't think he did much fighting after this. Yeah, because the, the, the sword helped other people folks, uh, it well helped him to keep other folks from splitting his skull open again. Now, Captain Lawrence, he was buried in Halifax with full military honors, with six British officers actually serving as his pallbearers. So that was nice of them. The Chesapeake, after serving in the Royal Navy, was sold at Portsmouth, England, for 500 pounds in 1819. Wow. And, and broken up. So it was effectively sold for scrap wood. Yeah. The Shannon was reduced to a receiving ship in 1831 and then broken up in 1859. That's a pretty long career. Yeah. So relative to the total number of men who participated in this battle, this was one of the bloodiest ship to ship battles of the age of sail. By comparison, HMS Victory suffered fewer casualties during the whole of the Battle of Trafalgar, and the entire battle lasted at most 15 minutes, which speaks to how fiercely everyone was fighting. Just between the uh, ruthlessness that was drilled into the British crew and then, you know, the American crew trying to repel the borders with everything but the kitchen sink. And how accurately... He was a that broke was able to get those cannons on target. That made a huge difference in this battle. Right. And then I imagine that lucky shot from the Americans toward uh, that shot certainly did a number on the British crew as well. Mm, well, it didn't. It was a surprise, but it had no effect on this battle. Oh, oh, OK. See, I was imagining it was like a a, a bunch of. Uh, ball shot being detonated. So, effectively, you know, like firing a shotgun point directly at the deck. I'm probably misinterpreting how it actually happened. At this point in the battle, two more cannon shot, no matter what is being shot, is not going to have any effect on what, how this battle turns out. Gotcha. I mean, you were already boarded. You were already slaughtered. Most of the crew was in hiding. Anybody who wasn't hiding was being slaughtered. Pretty much, if they had any officers alive at that point, they would have been striking the colors. Yeah. So that was... That was a... That was a hell of a battle. That was... That was very brutal. Uh, yeah, I think this is the most brutal battle we've covered so far. Yeah. So I think we're going to end with this battle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let's end on a downer note. <laughs> uh, you want you want to end on a, on a higher note? Okay. What happens when you eat too many navy beans? 
Uh, um, uh, quick trip to the poop deck. You end up with a dishonorable discharge. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, yeah. Anything you want to touch upon before we leave? Before we pull back into port? Well, we would love to hear from you folks what you think of our podcast. The more stars, the better. And if you'd like, we can even read it on the show. You can also reach us on social media. Our Twitter handle is... USN History Pod. And we wish you fair sails and following seas. Fair w- God. Fair winds. Dang it. And following seas. And you can also contact us by email if you want to tell Steve off because he can't remember three words. At US Navy History Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> All right, Captain. Yeah, I'll head to the chalkboard and write it out 50 times. I get it. I get it. US Naval History Podcast. Departing. <laughs>